It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Woohoo! Hello, everybody. How are you? Welcome to the new year. Glad I got that little technological glitch, whatever it was, uh, fixed. I just reopened everything and fired it back up, and now we're working. So, glad to be here. Um, glad that we are done with 2020. <laughs> <laughs> and starting 2020, 20, 2021, that's hard to say, 2021. We're so used to saying 2020 because we commented about it so frequently. So today we're going to talk about New Year's resolutions. Most of us make resolutions, but only 10% of the resolutions that get made are actually stuck to. Do you believe that? 90% of resolutions are not successful because I figure that people that make the resolutions are resolving to do things that they really don't want to do. If we wanted to do them, we wouldn't need to resolve that we need to do them, right? So we probably already do them because we like doing them. So that all makes sense. So as the CEO of Taxi, my goal is to help every one of our members become successful with their music most of our members either want to earn some income with their music, others define success as simply getting their music out to the world and having people appreciate it. For many taxi members, achieving both acknowledgement and income is a desirable goal. So I've put together some New Year's resolutions to help you achieve those goals. And most of the ideas that I'm going to present today are pretty easy to follow and achieve. So hopefully we get better than 10%. Um, you know, uh, people that actually follow through. Uh, but before we get started, if you're not a subscriber to this channel yet, click that red button and subscribe now. And if you didn't wear out your finger doing that, give us a thumbs up and tell us that you like this video and all the other videos that we do. And now on with the show. So before I talk about anything else, I want to tell you because I reread bits and pieces of both of these books over the weekend. Buy and read. I'm not, I mean, you have to do this. It's not just like a suggestion. It's like you got to do this. Buy and read The War of Art and Do the Work by Stephen Pressfield. Starting today. Order them right now while I'm yapping at you. Uh, the War of Art and Do the Work by Stephen with a V Pressfield, as it sounds. Uh, just trust me on this. Thousands of taxi members have, have read these books and, and swear by them. Our most successful members, almost to the person, have told me that they've read his books. Um, let's see. Uh, read The War of Art first, though. A lot of times people will read um, Do the Work. He's got another one called Turning Pro, and they think they're going to take a shortcut and just go right to Turning Pro. Read The War of Art first. It's a life-changing book. You will really enjoy it. It's an easy read, it's a fast read, and you'll be going, wow, I can't believe I've never read this before. People in the chat room were already commenting that they like it. War of Art was good. Yep, read a few years ago, actually read the whole series. Excellent series. And if you're a current Taxi member, or even if you just joined Taxi very recently, uh, don't forget in your Taxi member profile, there's a link to the Taxi Road Rally, which we did uh, early in November, uh, a couple of months ago. And Stephen Pressfield was my keynote interview. People loved it. So click the link, which will, it's a private link. Only taxi members can see it. It will take you to the Road Rally stuff and you'll see the Stephen Pressfield interview in there. It's the very first interview that we did. Um, yeah, don't miss that. Pressfield was awesome. So, research shows, I looked at a lot of research uh, yesterday and today actually, that New Year's resolutions are made about doing things that, making New Year's resolutions about things that you love to do, duh, have a much higher probability of success, double duh. Uh, it's much easier to accomplish things that are fun and rewarding. Well, that makes perfect sense. Fun makes it easy to start and rewarding gives you the motivation and forward momentum you need to stick with it. 
So think of New Year's resolutions as doing something for you. And I know, you know, dropping 10 pounds, that's a resolution for you. Um, certainly like quitting smoking or quitting drinking or, you know, procrastinating less. Um, there are a million common resolutions that I think people make. Um, those are hard, but those are also good for you, but they're really, really, really hard. So my advice, and because I'm now an official expert on New Year's resolutions, having read so much about them over the last couple of days, is don't get overwhelmed by creating resolutions that are big and general, like, I will succeed with my music. It's nice, but it's broad and it's big, and it's like, it doesn't have a firm, like, here's how you start. It's just, I'm going to do this thing. Well, I will succeed with my music is certainly admirable, but it's just too big and too broad. I will become a famous musician. We'd all love to be a famous musician, but again, it's broad, it's general. Where do you start? I will write hit songs. Well, of course you'd like to write hit songs, but where do you start? I will become a famous producer. Again, a really desirable goal, but it's a big and very general goal. So instead, create small achievable goals that will motivate you to move forward as you accomplish each one. Examples of this could be, I will create a simple instrumental cue with just two or three instruments. That's achievable, right? You could do that as soon as this show is over. Create a simple instrumental cue with just two or three instruments. Don't try something really big like, I'm going to do a massive orchestral cue that would be great for, you know, blockbuster movie trailers. That's something that you work up to. But a simple instrumental cue with like just, you know, an acoustic guitar doing strums and maybe a bottleneck slide on a dobro or something, that's a lot easier. And you will get the satisfaction of having accomplished something. Um, another one is, I will look at a list of genres of film and TV music and make a list of the ones that seem most easily achievable for me. Think about that for a minute. I will look at a list of genres of film and TV music and make a list of the ones that seem most easily achievable for me. Um, by the way, there's a great list in Steve Barden's book, um, do I have it? Yeah, hang on. I'll be right back. <laughs> Happened to have one sitting five feet away. There it is. Writing Production Music for TV by Steve Barden. In the back of this book, uh, let's see, where is it? In Appendix B. Um, no, Appendix A. Sorry, Appendix A, he's got lists of genres it's a very comprehensive list of genres and you know what spend a little time going through the genres and go oh that's a genre that i'm already good at or i'm comfortable with so that's your place to start so from steve barden's list or a list that you might find you know on a website somewhere tick off the ones that seem appealing to you, that are easy to achieve something in. Don't pick off things that you aspire to do down the road. Check off the ones that you can do now. Um, here's another one for you. I will print lyric sheets of my songs and highlight the lines or sections that are not general or universal lyrics so that I can better understand what not to write for film and TV songs. I'm going to repeat that one. I will print out lyric sheets of my songs. I mean, not mine, because I don't write songs, your songs. Print out lyric sheets and highlight the lines or sections that are not general or universal lyrics so that you can better understand what not to do for film and TV songs. So I'm kind of reverse, reversing the psychology, if you will, on that. Um, frequently, people will try and do it the other way, sit down and try a you know, struggle to write lyrics that are universal. And universal doesn't necessarily mean universally loved or universally applicable. Universal means that it could fit a lot of different scenarios. Um, I always use this dopey example because it's the only thing that pops into my head. A lyric that says, I met Susie under the arch in St. Louis on New Year's Eve, not universal. 
But you could talk about um, how Susie makes you feel without mentioning Susie's name. She makes me feel like I'm alive. She makes me feel brand new. She makes me feel head over heels in love. Those are general universal thoughts that can be applied to a lot of different things. And that makes them very usable in a bunch of different types of scenes and scripts um, for film and TV stuff. Uh, I will watch one video per day that teaches me how to use my DAW. For those of you who don't know the DAW word, that means digital audio workstation. I will watch one video per day that teaches me how to use my DAW and try each of those tips several times so that it becomes muscle memory. As most of you or many of you in the chat room know, um, right before the road rally, I had to get a new laptop because the old one was dying. So I got the new one loaded with Logic, uh, Logic Pro. And uh, I, I was very excited when I got it. I was really busy getting ready for the road rally, but I fiddled around with it for a couple hours here and there and was totally blown away by all the stuff that it could do. I'm sure I just scratched the surface, um, but I haven't yet endeavored to start watching videos like a beginner video and um, try each thing. And I do know from my own personal experience from years in the studio that learning something or figuring something out on a big console like an SSL or a Neve, so you figure it out in the heat of battle. If you don't do it a few times, do it repetitively, it doesn't get ingrained. It doesn't um, sink into your audio engineer being, you know, where you just do it by uh, almost intuitively, right? So as you're learning about your DAW, whatever it is that you learn, do it several times. Maybe do it several times again the next day until it becomes ingrained in your muscle memory. I will go, this is another resolution, I will go to the Taxi Forwards blog and listen to at least three forwards for listings that I didn't get forwarded for so I can take notes about what my fellow members did, the people who did get forwarded, so that I can incorporate those ideas or those things into my work. Were their mixes better? Um, were their beats more contemporary sounding? Um, were there pieces that got forwarded more stripped down, less complicated than yours? All that stuff is in there just waiting to be learned. So you might as well, you know, look at what the successful people are doing and imitate it. Now, I don't mean imitate it like do exactly what they did, but absorb the concepts. What about their thing, their piece of music, whether it's a song or an instrumental, made it more forwardable? <laughs> Is that a word? It's hard to say. Forwardable um, by the screener for that particular listing than yours was. So the information's out there. Just soak it up and do it. Um, here's another resolution. Set a time and an alarm for five days a week when you spend an hour per day working on your music. Uh, it, that's kind of a big commitment, you know, finding an hour a day, but hey, if you want to be successful, you can't do, you know, just like, gosh, I wish I was successful. Oh, I'm going to do an hour today. Yeah. You know, Michael's right. I'm going to do an hour. And then you don't do another hour for like another eight or nine days. No, you've got to do it with regularity. It's about a habit. So resolve that you're going to set an alarm five days a week the same time of day and sit down and work on your music. And by the way, turn this off. Turn your cell phone off. Um, as much as I love it, as much as we all love our phones, they connect us with the world. There's so much good stuff that goes on inside of your phone. Um, they're evil. <laughs> they are truly evil because they suck time. They take you down a rabbit hole that you probably shouldn't go down. You go on there to Google something or look at something on, on YouTube about, you know, some trick you want to do with your, with your DAW, and you end up spending the next three hours watching videos that are kind of related, but, you know, you went down a rabbit hole. You didn't stick with your purpose. So just turn off the phone. And for God's sake, please don't turn on social media. Uh, 
going to tell a story. My wife's not in the house. I think she's out running errands right now, so she's probably not watching today's show. My wife was, I'm just going to call it what it was. She hates, hated, hated, past tense, hated cell phones, hated smartphones more than anybody you've ever met. Um, she resisted for years and stayed with a funky old flip phone because I don't want to be one of those people that's constantly looking at my phone. Wherever I am, I'm looking at my phone, looking at my phone. About three or four years ago, I had to upgrade my phone. You know, the term on my contract was up and my phone, the battery was like I had to charge it five times a day. So I got myself a new phone. I figured, what the hell, I'm going to get her the same phone. So I got her a phone. And she, first thing she said was, thank you, but I don't need that. I don't want that. I don't want to be one of those people. Guess what? My wife is now one of those people. <laughs> We've been binge watching a, a series called Money Heist on Netflix um, over this holiday weekend. Uh, and man, oh man, she sits there with the phone on her lap and constantly I'm, I'm seeing in my periphery the light from the screen of her phone. Um, every single time her phone vibrates and she knows that somebody has posted something new on WhatsApp or some news group that she's on, whatever, constantly picking up the phone like Pavlov's dog. So uh, I don't need any more evidence than that because I've never met anybody who was so against um, smartphones as my wife and now she is utterly addicted to her phone. Um, I'm kind of addicted to my laptop, I got to say. First thing I do when I wake up in the morning is pull the laptop out from under the bed, flip it open, and look at it, even before I have my first cup of coffee. Um, try this. Here's a resolution for you. Um, don't look at any social media for an entire week. Can you do it? No social media for an entire week. I read somewhere... I don't know, two, three, four months ago that the average person spends 2.5 hours a day on social media. Facebook, Twitter, um, what else is there? Instagram seems to be, you know, the predominant form of social media these days. Two and a half hours a day. If you spent that same two and a half hours a day working on your music, how much faster would you become successful and achieve the goals that you really want? Goals that you've had, you know, for your entire adult life probably. Two and a half hours a day. Here, let's do some math on my smartphone. Um, where's the calculator? Two, I probably could have done this in my head. 2.5 times 7 equals 17 and a half hours a week times 52 weeks a year. 910 hours a year is what the average person is spending uh, looking at social media. Could you imagine what you could accomplish with 910 hours of time to work on your music? Mind-blowing, right? Um, <laughs> somebody says, butt book. <laughs> there you go. Um all right, uh, now here's another one. Easy to follow resolution. Resolve that you're going to make a list of unproductive things that you do that prevent you from doing what you should be doing. I, I don't think I've got enough paper in a spiral, now, spiral bound notebook to make a list of all the things that I do that I shouldn't be doing. Uh, if you read uh, Stephen Pressfield's books, you'll see that he spends a lot of time, and appropriately so, um, talking about the, the term resistance. And, and resistance is anything that distracts you from or prevents you from doing what you know you should be doing. It could be drugs, it could be alcohol, it could be TV, it could be um, social media, just anything that distracts you, that causes you to procrastinate or to just not do what you're supposed to be doing. Um, so make a list and then put that list on a wall, like right by, you know, in your studio area so that every time you start doing something that is other than working on your music, look up at the list and see if, if that thing that you're doing 
is on the list. And then you'll be guilt ridden. And then maybe you won't do it. Guilt is good. Um, here's a resolution. And this one's inspired by one of our uh, successful uh, members, a gentleman named Randon Purcell, who's become successful at doing trailers and TV promos. Randon gets up at 4.30 in the morning. Now, that may be too early for some people, but he, he swears by it. He gets up at 4.30 in the morning and works on his music stuff before his family ever gets up. They probably get up at like 7 a.m. So he gets two and a half hours of work done um, before they ever get out of bed in the morning. Let's do a little math on that. Um, clear. Okay, so 2.5 times 7... So there you go. He gets 17 and a half hours. So imagine if you don't look at social media for the two and a half hours a day that the average person does, and you wake up at 4.30 in the morning, um, you're now going to have 35 hours a week of time to spend on your music. That's almost a full-time job. 35 hours a week to work on your music. Makes sense, right? So, you know, even if 4.30 is a little brutal for you, get up at 5. Set the coffee machine for 4.55. So when you wake up at 5, it's piping hot and ready to go. And the first thing you should do is, is literally suck down a full cup of coffee and just get that caffeine rush and get your butt in gear. Um, a good thing to do, something that I actually try to do and I'm reasonably successful at it, is write down one thing that you will do with your early time before you go to bed each night. I actually have one of those week at a glance books and I try at the end of every work day or before I go to bed at night, I try and write down the important things that I wanna do the next day. And having that to-do list for the next day is super helpful. I actually accomplish probably 70 or 80% of that stuff in any given day. And if I don't get it done that day, I draw an arrow to the next day. And then I start to feel the guilt by the time I get to like the third or fourth day of the week. And by the end of the week, I've pretty much accomplished everything that I set out to do. So basically a to-do list, but a to-do list that's on a calendar. It works. Um, here's a good one. And this one was inspired by Ariana um, uh, a recently former employee of Taxi that we hope comes back someday. Um, when we first went uh, remote, when COVID first hit and the staff went remote, I remember second or third day, um, I did a little video chat with Ariana about something. Uh, it was probably on WhatsApp doing the you know live video thing. And I said, wow, look at you. You're all dressed for work. I mean, she was dressed like she would dress to go to work every day. It's, and she said, yeah, of course, I'm working. I dressed for work, even though she was working from home. Um, let's face it, most of us during COVID have been working, you know, in a pair of gym shorts and a ratty t-shirt, you know, or, or sweats or our or, or jammies. Um, but I, ever since she told me that, um, I've been, I would say most days, probably 90% or greater, of work days, I actually get up and get dressed. Sometimes I'll start the day out, you know, working in like my gym shorts and t-shirt, whatever I slept in, um, and maybe do an hour of stuff in the morning that's usually before the staff is up and working. I do that like from 7.30 or eight in the morning till around nine or 9.15. But then I shower and put on my work clothes. By the way, I have a spot on my sweater. I noticed this right before we went on the air. I tried to get it out with a wet dish towel. Didn't work. So there you go. <laughs> now you can't see my spot. Um, so thank you, Ariana, for suggesting getting dressed for work each day, even when you're working remotely and working from home. And let's face it, most of you have home studios. So you know what? Dress like you're going to work because making music is a job. It's a fun job. It's a job you want to be doing, but it is a job. Um create a to-do list and check off items as you accomplish them. I swear, Taxi as a company would not exist if not for the fact that I love spiral bound notebooks. And when I had the idea to start the company, I sat down and made an exhaustive to-do list. There's so many things you have to do when you start up a company. Like 
incorporating it and filing a DBA and setting up bank accounts and getting a tax ID number, um, coming up with a name, coming up with a logo, coming up with the world's leading independent A&R company, a tagline, um, just a million little things like that. Um, letterhead, business cards, um, a phone number, not just any phone number, but a phone number that people can remember, setting up email accounts. Um, if you're going to do marketing, and you should um, market anything, whether it's a service or a product, you've got to understand search engine optimization. You've got to build a website so that you can employ what you've learned about SEO or search engine optimization. You have to understand um, AdWords, which is Google advertising, a million things like that. So I made a list of all those things. I mean, right down to even like coming up with the numbers that we use for listing numbers, um, coming up with the concept of giving the screeners, um, every screener gets a, a unique number that we would never ever repeat again in the company's history. Um, trying to think of other stuff that I did. Um, getting a P.O. box, um, I don't know, just a million things. And then after you've made that list, then rip those pages out of the spiral bound and now put them down again on fresh pages in the order in which you need to do them. Like it doesn't make sense to sit down and start designing a business card or a website if you don't have a phone number, you don't have an email address, or you don't have a name for the company, there are some things that just have to come first. So do them in the order in which they need to be done and check them off or cross them out. And I literally got to the last one on the list. It was pages long. Uh, and when I got to the last one, I went, okay, this is it, Bubba. It's company time. And that was the birth of Taxi, which by the way, on January 15th, I believe, will be our 29th year in business. So thank goodness for the spiral bound notebook with the list of stuff to do. Um, by the way, uh, something that I, I've, I've read, I don't know, 10 books on productivity over the years, and virtually every one of those books um, has a section on what they call either chunking or slicing, which is, is taking tasks and rather than looking like at a whole salami and going, wow, how am I going to eat that whole damn salami? Eat it one slice at a time. So that way it's less overwhelming because if it's overwhelming, you're not going to do it. But you can stick one slice of salami in your mouth unless you're a vegetarian. Then you'd have to eat veggie salami. And I tried it once and it was terrible. Just saying. Um, nothing beats hard, dry salami that's like so hard, so dry that it's like eating beef jerky. I love that stuff. Not healthy, but sure is tasty. All right. Here's a list of simple stuff, okay? These are things that you can do in five minutes and do at the start of every day. Here we go. Examples of things that you can do in five minutes every day. So these are easy resolutions to make, easy resolutions to follow. Don't miss opportunities. Take just five minutes every day to look at Taxi's newest listings, the one we send you in emails, 363 days a year, I believe. I think we don't send them on Christmas Day and we don't send them on Easter Day. 363 days a year, we send you out brand new requests for music from the industry. How many of those do you actually look at? There's gold. I mean, literally, like, how many of those listings are in there that would be appropriate for what you already do or what you can do. And just because you go, oh yeah, there's another batch taxi listings and you don't look at it, you let it slide. You might've missed the opportunity that got you into a library that turned into a great relationship that eventually turns into lots of placements and turns into credibility so that you get into other music libraries. Um, here's another one that's easy to do and takes just five minutes. Listen to one reference song or track in a taxi listing every day to get familiar with current artists, sounds, and production styles. One of the things I hear more often than any other thing probably is I keep getting, uh, you know, the, the checkbox says my music doesn't sound contemporary or current. 
Um, the only way to really learn how to be current is to listen to current material. It's not like there's an exact prescription for it. It's certainly a moving target, so it's always changing. But, you know, Robin Frederick, who we all know and love, um, the author of Shortcuts to Hit Songwriting, a great songwriting coach, um, an extremely well-educated, well-informed and articulate lady, um, said when she was on Taxi TV a couple of weeks ago, she was... I said something to her like, Robin, I can't believe how, how hip you are to, you know, all this new music. And she said, Michael, I get it from the taxi listings. I, she literally looks at the taxi listings every day, even though she's not a member. She used to be our head screener. Um, she doesn't need to look at them because she wants to submit music to them. She looks at them because we do all the work of researching the references or the references come to us from our industry contacts that are running the listings, what better way to understand what new current music that you're probably not familiar with yet than to look at examples where we give you links to go right to them 363 days a year. Does it get any easier than popping open an email and going, oh, there's a genre that appeals to me that I can probably do well. Let me listen to a reference and make sure it's not a reference of something that you are already familiar with. That's kind of wasted time. Listening to stuff that you're not familiar with is important because it's going to expand your horizons. It's going to tune your ears. It's going to be absorbed by your brain. So when you start producing your own stuff, the stuff that you heard that sounded current and cool and trendy, um, that stuff seeps into you by osmosis and it comes back out when you're making new music. So listen to one reference song or instrumental track in, the, in a taxi listing that is referenced every day of the year. Just one. If you can listen to two or three, even better. Here's another one. Take any musical genre you feel comfortable with and make a quick list of moods or emotions within that genre. Let's say that one more time. Take any musical genre that you feel comfortable with um, and make a quick list, just a five minute list. It doesn't have to be exhaustive. You don't have to make it half a day's work, just five minutes. So here's an example, take rock. Um, especially if you're doing music for media, um, making great rock, rock music is great. Making great rock music that creates an identifiable mood or emotion is wonderful because that makes it more usable in the context of what music supervisors need, what editors working on reality shows need. So let's take rock. You could do anthemic rock. You could do uplifting rock. You could do dark and scary rock. You could do sad, depressing rock. You could do rock that's got a swagger, rock that feels determined that would work well, let's say for sports television. You could do angry rock. You could do haunting rock, carefree rock, mechanical rock, which, uh, Trying to define mechanical is not that easy, but think about shows like um, How They Make It or whatever it's called, How, how It's Made, I think. Um, they have music that works really well when they're showing you know, the slow-mos uh, of the assembly line making a particular product. So mechanical rock, rousing rock, rebellious rock, you get the idea. So it's one thing to make great rock. It's another thing to make great rock that's usable because it portrays an emotion or a mood and it's obvious what it portrays. That makes it so much more usable by the people on the end user side that need what you are making. Here's another one that's really easy to do. Um, and, and only give yourself five minutes. Write just one short melody per day. Write one melody per day. You don't have to write an entire song. You don't have to write three minutes of melody. It could just be five notes. It could just be a line. But just one melody a day, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent. Over time, they will get better. Over time, they will come more easily to you because repetition makes things easier. 
um, just one melody per day. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, write just one song title per day. Talk about a great starting point, just one song title. It could be, you know, pick up a book. I mean, probably not this book. Uh, not that it's not a great book, but pick up a novel and, and look for a great line in a novel and then turn that into a title. And then once you've got a title, um, every day you could try and write one lyric line that goes with that title. Just one line per day. That's an achievable goal. It's not sit down and write a song per day. That's kind of daunting, but just one line a day. Um, yeah, this one's kind of repetitive. Write down just one idea for a song topic. That, that would probably come from a, a title or whatever you, you grab out of a novel. Um, here's an easy one, really easy. Listen to music from one of your fellow members each day and start to build a list of potential collaborators. There is absolutely no doubt in my mind, and I'm sure no doubt in the minds of people who are regular taxi TV watchers or go to the quarantini happy hours, which are on Tuesdays and Thursdays, 4 o'clock, same channel. Um, they understand that more taxi deals happen and more success happens because of collaborations. So how do you find a collaborator? Well, you've got to find the right collaborator. Not just some, don't just find a taxi member who's been very successful and reach out and say, hey, would you collaborate with me? They get hit with that all the time. People want to ride the coattails of their success. They want to be associated with somebody who's more successful than they are. Um, it, it's not a, a terrible idea, but picking the right collaborator that does the right genres of music that are the genres you work in and is complementary to the skill sets that you have. Let's say you're a great top liner, but you're not a great builder of tracks. You're not that handy with your DAW yet. Um, engineering and production are not your, your forte. But if you find somebody that also does, let's say, you know, dramedy instrumental cues, and you're really good with coming up with quirky little melodies that would work well in dramedy, but you're not very good at engineering and producing those tracks, Find somebody who happens to be, a, you know, makes great tracks. They sound great. They're well produced, but they haven't had a lot, lot of luck yet because their stuff doesn't have that thing. Maybe they don't have a great melody yet. Um, and find ways to collaborate with people that complement the skills that you have. Um, so make a list every day. Go on the Taxi Forum at forums.taxi.com. Hang out in the chat room here on Taxi TV. Get to know your fellow members. Eventually, you're fi you'll figure out who does what and pick your collaborator and then reach out to them and say, hey, I noticed that you do this um, and I do that. Want to take a shot at collaborating together. Kind of like dating. You know, sometimes it works out. Sometimes it works out really, really well. Sometimes it doesn't work out well. No big deal. Move on to the next collaborator. You got to keep trying until you find the perfect fit. And then once you find a great fit, expand your horizons and maybe learn to collaborate with two or three other people. Um, that's how it's done. Our most successful members, almost to the person, are collaborative in the work that they do. Um, here's one. Um, this is the guilt trip. Uh, I'm really into guilt. Maybe it's growing up in a Jewish family. I don't know, but guilt is a big, it's, it's a big motivator, motivator in my life. Print or buy a calendar and put a big red X on every day that you don't do a five-minute goal. I mean, big red X. And, you know, maybe just print out, go in the calendar on your computer and just print out the month of January. And every day that you don't do one of these five-minute exercises or five-minute things, um, put a big red X. <laughs> After about four or five days, you're going to look at that and go, I'm a big fat loser because <laughs> I'm putting big red Xs on more days than not. That should be enough to motivate you, make you feel guilty enough to be motivated to get your you-know-what together and start doing this stuff, right? Um, and put it on a wall right there in your studio area. This is my imaginary studio right here because I'm looking at my computer. I got my microphone. I've got 
Keith LeBrant sitting right there. Um, so put it where you work so that every morning when you get up early and go to your dedicated time that you're going to work on your music, there's that calendar staring you in the face going, shame on you. You didn't do your five-minute uh, exercise yesterday. So one of the things that I've, I've known for quite some time, but it was reinforced by what I learned uh, prepping for the show, is that the human brain is wired to recognize and welcome patterns. The human brain loves a good pattern. It loves repetition. So if you make something a habit, like spending that five minutes a day working on one of the aforementioned things, your brain will soon see it as a pattern because it's something you do over and over, duh. And your brain will begin to like it so much that when you don't do it, it's actually gonna feel like there's a little void. Your subconscious is gonna be going, where's that thing? Why didn't we spend the five minutes today doing something that moves us forward? And that's you and your brain talking to each other. Um, so that, that will fill that emotional void and drive you to stick with the habit. Um, conversely, when you make something a habit, your brain will reward you with a shot of dopamine. Yep. When your brain likes something, it rewards you with a shot of dopamine when you do it, causing you to do it more effortlessly over time. Uh, remember, when I started out talking about New Year's resolutions, I said that the resolutions that are the big, audacious, really hard to accomplish ones, those are things that you know you should be doing that you're not, and you're probably not going to stick with the resolutions and not accomplish your goals. But if you choose achievable, small slices, chunk it out, baby, um, Every time you do those things, it's going to reward you with a little shot of dopamine and self-satisfaction. And that's what motivates you to keep doing it. All of our successful members, literally every successful member I've ever had a conversation with, they all tell me the same thing, which is taxi was quite daunting at first. Uh, they hated the rejection. They hated getting returns. Um, and then eventually they kind of learned to bite the bullet and read what the screeners, the feedback the screeners were giving them. And they just stuck with it and kept submitting. And then they get a forward. And that forward was so such a joyous moment. And that motivated them. Well, if I got one forward, maybe I get another forward. And then they got a deal offer. Well, if I got one deal offer, maybe I can get two or three or five or 20. So it's all part of that forward momentum and it's caused by the dopamine being released in your brain um, from the satisfaction you have with accomplishing something and that's what gets you into this habitual cycle of being productive and that's how you become successful with your music. If you do it for a day or a week or a month and you do it kind of haphazardly, not on a regular basis, not habitually, it's going to slip away. It's not going to have the same effect. Um, here's an original thought that I had. <laughs> if you wait to start until you have all your ducks in a row, you'll never start. If you wait to start until you have all your ducks in a row, you'll never start. I'm guilty of that. I'm absolutely guilty of that. Um, I, I learned to get all my ducks in a row when I started Taxi and made that incredibly long list of things that I had to do. So I know that that works successfully for me and I tend to want to do it in other areas of my life. And sometimes you just don't need that exhaustive list um, because it is daunting and it's overwhelming. So don't wait, especially when it comes down to like, you know, I'm going to do one instrumental cue. Let's go back to what I said earlier in the show, which is starting out doing one simple instrumental cue. So if you wait until you have all your ducks in a row before you start doing that one simple instrumental cue, you'll never do it. Some of the ducks that you might be waiting for are like, well, I need a new sample library, or I need a new microphone, or I need a new keyboard, or I need to update some software. No, just do it. Just friggin' do it. It doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be great. It just has to be done. Because once you do that one thing, and then the next day you do it again, the next day you do it again, it becomes habitual. Once things become habitual, then the dopamine is released. You get the motivational force going, and then it becomes fun. And remember, 
you are doing all this in the context of making music, which is something you love to do anyway, right? Um, make yourself accountable by making one of your music friends sort of a study buddy and emailing or texting them the one thing that you accomplish every day. And I know I'm looking at the chat room right now and I see so many people in here that I know. Um, <clears throat> let's see, we've got Ken Mesford, Ed, uh, Busecker, uh, Marion Laird, Dan Weber, Martin Gravel, Richard Carr, Ghost of Young Michael. Uh, I mean, I know all you guys, Jan Weilidge, Kendall Scott, uh, nope, <laughs> Christoph Scott, sorry. Um, Marion Laird, if I'd say that, Terrell Beckless, Ewart Williams. Anyway, you guys know each other. You've gotten to know each other in the chat room. Why not pick one of those people? And you guys become study buddies, for lack of a better way to say it, and make a plan. And every day, all you have to do is text your friend and say, today I did a stupid little instrumental cue. It was really easy, but I did it. I did it from start to finish. It's 90 seconds long. It's got the instrumentation in there. I don't even need to play it for you, so I don't have to worry about you judging it. You could do that, but you don't have to. Just send them a text or an email saying, I did my cue today. And they can write you back and say, I did mine as well. If you've got somebody to work with that will hold you accountable, you are much more likely to get your stuff done. Um, same thing is true uh, when I started Taxi. It got to the point where I was embarrassing my wife. Anytime we would go to a friend's house for dinner, for a barbecue, whatever social thing we went to. So, Michael, what are you doing? Well, I'm starting a company called Taxi. Really? Tell me about it. And I would tell them all about it, how it's going to work, how much we're going to charge, what I'm going to call it. Um, and my wife is like, honey, all you ever talk about is that stupid company. But I actually had a plan. And the plan was if I tell enough people, people that I care about, people that I would be embarrassed to fail in front of, particularly my family, but my friends as well, um, you are much less likely to fail if you let a lot of people know what you're doing. Um, and if you do let a lot of people know what you're doing and you fail to do it, uh, you should be embarrassed <laughs> because I'm not asking you to tell a bunch of people, I'm going to be a, a hit songwriter in 90 days. I'm not asking you to tell people, I'm going to get signed to a record deal in 90 days or I'm going to score a blockbuster Hollywood movie in 90 days or six months or a year. Again, we're talking about achievable goals. So tell everybody you know, I just bought Logic Pro and I'm forcing myself happily to watch a video per day to learn how to do that, to how to use my dog well. If you tell enough people, pretty soon you're gonna bump into them at the next barbecue when we can go to barbecues again, and they're gonna say, so how's it going? You know, are, are you learning Logic Pro? Uh, no, I didn't follow through. Nobody wants to be that person, right? Nobody wants to admit to their friends or their family members that they failed by doing something that all you had to do was just do it. But instead you watch TV or, you know, you went down a rabbit hole of social media. You did whatever form your resistance took in your life that prevented you from doing that thing, now you've got to fess up to the people around you. So tell as many people and tell them with detail. Um, and hopefully they're the kinds of friends and family members will say, so how's it going? Are you learning Logic Pro? Um, so that's it, that's my list. Um, in a minute, I want to hear from you guys what your resolutions are. Um, and I made one final thought. And this is my own thing. I didn't hijack this from anybody's book or see it on a website. And that is start small to achieve big. Start small to achieve big. Rome wasn't built in a day. But, you know, you got to pick up a shovel and one shovel of dirt at a time. So start small to achieve big. And there we have it. Michael Lasko's tips on making New Year's resolutions that you will actually stick with rather than falling into the 90% of the losers that don't. Wow. Uh, 
Yeah, what was that book again? Hey, Robert Vell, of course, how are you? The book was The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. <laughs> Edmund Red is giving me an eye clap. Woo! Uh, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Carrie Harchin says, bravo, Michael, thank you. That's right. Cass McKenty says, baseball equals singles make home runs. Yes, that's a great analogy. I love it, Cass. Jesse Peck, the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of your success comes from 20% of your efforts. Uh, Jeff, how do you pronounce your name? Her Hergy? Uh, says Learning Logic Pro. I'm right there with you. I've got to find the time. Taxi always comes first in my life, but I definitely want to learn Logic Pro. Um, I'm afraid that I'll, I'll like retire from taxi and go off making records again. Excuse me. Um, you are welcome to all you people saying thank you. Um, it was inspiring to me. Uh, you know, a lot of times when I do the research to put these shows together, um, it helps me as well. So, you know, thank you for giving me a reason to help myself. Uh, Karen Brasher says she's enjoying having the time to do music due to the lockdown. Yeah, you know, um, man, I hope that uh, the vaccines start to work, that they get them out to enough people. And, uh, you know, maybe there's some light at the end of the tunnel and someday we'll be able to go out and have, you know, have dinner at a restaurant. Um, but in the meanwhile, while we are primarily locked down at home, uh, what a great time to work on all this stuff. There's never been a better time to make resolutions that you actually can find the time to, to accomplish. Uh, let's see, Scott Alexander, my New Year's resolution was to give people directions without using my hands or arms, but Michael's advice seems so much more practical for my music. I agree. <laughs> um, wow, Buffalo Bob filled a whole page of notes in his spiral bound notebook tonight. Good stuff. Thank you. You know what? I am going to take this document that I did today's show from and I'll have Bria post, post it um, in the blog section of the taxi website and we will either send out an email or in the next taxi TV we'll give out the link to it um, just in case you didn't write down you know take notes throughout the whole thing I'll be more than happy to share my notes small chunks it is No resolutions here. Just keep on trucking. Yeah, well, you're already doing it, Cass. You know, I've, I've, it's so funny. I've gotten to know so many of you from doing Taxi TV and the Quarantini Happy Hours. And, and I've learned about your progress just from hanging out with you in the chat room. And Cass is one of those people that, uh, you know, I, I've known about Cass. I've seen him on the forums for years. Um, I knew what he looked like from seeing his picture on the forum. Um, I've seen him in the chat room on taxi TVs. And then I think two road rallies ago, I saw him in the audience. That was probably the first time that we actually said hello. I think I was actually walking through the audience with a microphone, um, taking questions from audience members and went, Hey Cass, how are you? And, and that was the beginning of, of a friendship, you know, and, and, uh, I invited him to do a passenger profile. And so I've learned about him and I've watched his progress, but you're doing the stuff, Cass. You're doing exactly what I'm talking about. I don't know the particulars of how you're doing it, but I know that you're collaborating. I know that you work on your music regularly. You're doing all the right stuff and it's starting to pay off in the form of signing deals and, and getting placements, right? So there you go. Um, take notes when listening to Taxi TV. Yep. Uh, David says, taking five minutes to read taxi emails and other ones that are related is a good resolution. Yeah, I mean, how hard is it to pop open an email and look at three listings? If Robin Frederick is doing it, that's got to tell you something. A 
Scott Alexander. I'm a Logic Pro user, but just purchased the full version of FL Studio for electronic compositions. Learning that DAW is a goal. There you go. Ken Mesford, I feel like Taxi is becoming my new family. Well, just don't get rid of your old one. They'd be really pissed off at me for that, but thanks. <laughs> um... Karen Brasher says, I agree with starting small and building. It really works. It does. You know, anytime you take on just a, a big, hairy, audacious goal, chances are you're not going to accomplish it. I mean, people recommend taking on big, you know, be a big thinker, take on a big goal. But I think that that's daunting for most people. John Linderman wants to know, do you schedule time each day for reading music-related books? Um... I'm going to confess something that I don't think I've ever confessed on Taxi TV before, ever. But as many of you do know, I've read over 800 business books. The vast majority of them are marketing books or copywriting books. I love copywriting. Um, I, I just love it. I really, for me, it's like crafting a great song lyric. Um, every day, I get up in the morning, I grab my cup of coffee. And when it's time to hit the library, in quotes, if you know what I mean, um, I, that's where I do my reading. And I, I literally spend an hour in the library, in quotes, every morning, seven days a week, 365 days a year with extremely rare exceptions. Even when I go on vacation, I'll bring two or three books on a vacation with me. And I read because that's my quiet time. Nobody's coming in there. Nobody's going to bother me. And uh, I'll sit there. I, I, I'm tempted to run upstairs and show you, you know, whatever. I, I'm not going to take the laptop and the camera up there. But in our bathroom is like a little shelf unit next to the toilet that holds washcloths and towels. And it, I've got a bookshelf going in there. And I would be willing to bet that if we went in there right now, that there's somewhere between five and 10 books in that bookshelf. And, you know, sometimes you hit a, a slow spot in a book. And normally the, what you do is you stop reading it. It's like, eh, all right, I've lost my interest in this book. I'll keep the book on the shelf. I'll start reading another book. Sometimes I'll read two or three books at the same time and alternate them, you know, day by day. But um, I find that staring at the unread books is a motivator to finish them. But I underline, I highlight, um, I make notes like crazy. I'm looking, I think my, my mail bin is out in the garage right now with all my marketing books. I mean, I've got, I've got them in my office. I've got a bookshelf behind my chair in the office. It's probably got 100. I've got um, like an Amwar thing in the office. It's probably got about 300 books. I've easily got another 300 here in the house. I've given away a ton of them over the years. Um, but I highlight, I underline, and I write notes. And I've got the, um, do I have one nearby? All right, so, you know, like, there we go. Page after page after page after page of notes. Um, and then there's post-it notes on top of my notes. Um, that's my 2019 to 2020, whoops, there we go, 2019 to 2020 um, uh, spiral bound. And what I do is I go through at the end of the year, that's why this one is sitting here. At the end of every year, I will take the spiral bound notebook for that year and I go through and I look for hidden gems. Sometimes I'm reading a book in the morning and I have a great idea and I write down the idea inside the cover of the book. But when I finish the book, the idea just stays there. So at some point, I have to take those ideas and put them in the spiral bound. And then I go back and, and look at the pages of the spiral bound and say, wow, that was a great idea. For instance, on this was an idea I had I don't think was generated by a book. I think I had it in a marketing meeting one day recently, maybe a staff meeting, a Zoom situation. Um, somebody on the staff asked me if I would take a look at the welcome letter that new members get when they join Taxi. And our uh, you know internal database automatically spits out a <clears throat> welcome to Taxi, Bob. Glad to have you as a member email. 
Um, and it's probably got links to Taxi TV and some other important stuff, maybe a little rah-rah in there. And uh, I thought, you know what? Why don't I do a Zoom meeting? I don't use Zoom for these things because there are some things that Zoom just can't do and the picture quality is not as good, can be a little flaky. But starting this Wednesday at four o'clock, I'm doing a new member Zoom. So everybody who joined Taxi in the month of December um, got an email this afternoon and they're gonna get another email reminder on Wednesday. Wednesday at four o'clock, I'm gonna go live with the Zoom. You know, I could have 50 or 100 people in there. I don't know, I mean, obviously we had hundreds of people that joined Taxi in the month of December, but not all of them are gonna show. And for those who don't, they're really gonna miss out because all the stuff that I have been teaching on Taxi TV and the Quarantini Happy Hours all these years, I'm taking the most important success tips that I know that work from our most experienced and successful members. And I'm consolidating all that down to the Zoom thing. And I'm gonna start doing it every month unless it, it could turn out to be a failure. I don't know, but you don't know until you try. But I think that'll be great. This way people can meet each other, meet other members right in the beginning of their membership. They can learn about how important collaboration is. They can learn that you're much more likely to be successful with Taxi if you create music in response to the listings rather than trying to shoehorn square pegs into round holes. Oh yeah, I wrote a song seven years ago. Um, even though it's not perfect for what the listing says, it does have some aspects of what the listing asked for. So I'm gonna submit that. They're gonna hear how brilliant it is and they're gonna forward it anyway. I'm gonna break people of that habit in the new member Zoom. So all those kinds of things. So that's a great example of having an idea, writing it down, and then eventually following through with it. So I will let you know how that goes. What's the best label? Um, if you're asking about a record label, um, it's impossible to say. That's like saying, you know, um, what's the best TV network? It's a matter of, you know, what kind of music do you do? Um, the way to find, figure out which label might be best for you is look at a label that's got the kinds of artists that you are cohesive with. Um, I mean, if you're an EDM artist, you don't want to be on a country label. If you're a country artist, you don't want to be on a rock label. So look for labels, um, look at Spotify playlists, look at charts and billboard, and make a list of 20 artists that you think um, are artists that are loosely in your ballpark or you're in their ballpark, and then see if there are certain record labels that pop up um, frequently for those artists. Those are the labels you would wanna be on. Michael Mishna says, uh, it's the label that signs you. That's true. But you know what? That could be wrong, Michael, because I, I've seen cases where a label signed an artist that just wasn't a good fit for what they do. I mean, back in the day when labels had, you know, like radio promo people and field sales reps, um, they had, you know, all that label behind the scenes machinery going on. And they had their certain way that they work and their certain set of contacts, um, and so like a country artist signed to a pop label is not going to get the same treatment and the same advantages that a country artist would get on a country label that knows program directors at country radio stations, that knows everything, you know, all the people in the country music sphere, those are the people that you want your label people to know because that's how records get promoted and become popular. So... Yeah, you got to choose a label that knows what to do for your kind of music. <laughs> label that says Jack Daniels. <laughs> Gotta go. Bye bye. See you, Dave Barnett. Do you really need a label in 2021? Um, says Terrell Burt. Hi, Terrell. How are you? Um, 
they are becoming more and more obsolete because of the internet, but you know what? There are very, very, very few artists that I've personally met that have the wherewithal, the business smarts, the experience, the knowledge base, um, and are willing to work 12 to 18 hours a day because that's what it takes to launch a business. You literally have to be obsessed and so obsessed that you will work 12, 14, 16, 18 hours a day, seven days a week, pretty much to the exclusion of all else in your life, including your family, sad to say. Um, that's what it takes to successfully launch a business with extremely rare, you know, sometimes they're accidental successes, but if you're holding out for one of those, you're doomed. Um, same thing is true for being a successful artist on the internet. The chances of you putting a few songs up on, you know, like SoundCloud, Spotify, um, CD Baby, um, come on, how many artists are out there that, you know, have gotten distribution through CD Baby or one of the other online distributors? And then nothing happens. They get all excited. Oh, yeah, somebody downloaded my song from Germany last night. Well, that's satisfying. I can understand. That's pretty cool that somebody from, you know, 8,000 miles away loved your music enough to download it for 99 cents or that you got, you know, 826 streams last month. But you're not going to make any substantial money like you would being a hit artist who's on the charts and working with a record label by doing that unless you're willing to work 12, 14, 16, 18 hours a day, pretty much seven days a week for a long period of time without giving up and your music is freaking great. You can't have mediocre music and follow that prescription and have it work out. First, you have to make great music. Then you have to follow that prescription and you have to have that work ethic. <laughs> Cass says you need a label to perform at the Super Bowl or an Illuminati connection. Man, how great was Lady Gaga at the Super Bowl? Was it two years ago or three years ago? I, I, I watched that like three times a year. Uh, my wife and I just watched it again, I don't know, maybe two weeks ago. I ordered a, a, another ring security camera slash you know, light with a, a motion detector on it for the other side of our house. And they had a special running where you got a free um, Amazon Echo, the one with the, the little video screen that's about the size of a cell phone. That came with it for free. I didn't really, I've got one Amazon Echo and it's great. Every morning I wake up and ask her what the weather's going to be or I set an alarm with it. I don't use it for much, but I do like it. Um, so did I really need one with a screen? No. So I put it in the kitchen and uh, my wife was just enamored with the fact that she could say, uh, I don't want to say it right now because it'll start playing A-L-E-X-A. -E she probably spells. She's like 10 feet away from me right now. Um, you know, play uh, XYZ kind of music while my wife is cooking. And she loves to cook with music on. And uh, so to show her how it worked, I said, you know, A-L-E-X-A, -E play Lady Gaga. And we sat there just mesmerized by listening to three or four Lady Gaga songs, how incredibly talented she is. That caused me to say, you know what? We got to watch the Super Bowl performance again. It was, I, I thought it was by far the single best Super Bowl performance by any other artist. Um, Sorry, I'm scanning. For those of you who are watching the archive, you see me sitting here with this dumb look on my face because I'm scanning the chat room. Uh, Terrell Beckless, uh, if you ever thought asking me if I've ever thought about expanding into the music industry, uh, for example, starting your own label or owning music libraries. Um, I can't really own a music library because I'd be competing with the libraries that run listings. Um, that help you guys. So no, plus taxi is a very, very, very full-time job. Um, uh, 
Giovanni, <laughs> how can I get up at 4.30 a.m. if here it's already 2.30 2, uh, 2 a.m.? Anyway, music is my first thought in the morning and the last thought at night. That's great. See, that's you will be successful. If you're not already, you will be because that's what it takes. Kip Johnson, yo. Yo. Yo, Adrian. I didn't see Steven Tyler sing the the national anthem at the Indy 500. Uh, was that, are you doing an LOL because it was horrible or because it was great? Um, we do taxi compilations, but we only release them to people in the industry that might sign you. Um, did I make any resolutions? I make resolutions all the time. Um, you know, the most important resolution I've ever made in my life, and it's the one really big one that I stuck with, um, I don't often share this with people because they think it's, uh, it's like, come on, nobody could do that. But it was actually pretty easy. Um, I remember I, I was married to my first wife. It was 1984 turning into 1985. And for some reason, we had a few people over for New Year's Eve. I kind of wandered off into the corner of the dining room uh, of our condo in New Jersey and I shut my eyes and almost like in a little prayer-like fashion, I said to myself, my resolution is that I'm not going to lie. Not that I was a profound liar or anything, but I, I realized how many people around me, people, uh, family members, people, friends, family, that people I loved, they thought nothing of telling little white lies. Um, it's like somebody would call and invite them to go out to dinner. Oh, I can't, I'm having, you know, tummy issues or whatever. It's amazing how many little white lies we tell in a given day. And so I made a commitment to myself that night at the stroke of midnight going into 1985 that I was going to give it my absolute best effort not to even tell little white lies. And I got to say, it's worked out quite well. It's something that I barely ever talk about in my life. Um, and sometimes it's hard, you know, sometimes it, it's tough to be completely honest and transparent, but you know what? You feel a lot better about yourself and it actually becomes an easier way to go through life. So there you go. Um, that's right. There, there's the, the greatest lie. Taxi loves all of your music. <laughs> uh, my halo is askew. <laughs> Wow, most impressive resolution I ever heard was Jason Bloom swearing off sugar to avoid death from diabetes. Uh, yeah, but you know what? <laughs> when you've got death from diabetes staring you in the face, seems like it'd be a pretty easy resolution to keep, right? Buffalo Bob, is that the truth? <laughs> Milt Reader, how are you, Milt? Uh, Milt says we're all feeling the ripple effect of that resolution, not going to lie. Yeah, you know... I don't know why in that moment I decided to make that resolution, uh, but it's been life-changing. It really has. And it got easier and easier as the days went by. It became something that I don't even have to think about. Um, you know, given the choice to tell a white lie and weasel out of going out to dinner with somebody or just being honest and saying, you know what? I got to be honest, I'm just not up for it, man. <laughs> Can we push it back a couple of months rather than saying, oh, I've been having, you know, tummy issues all day. It's like, why lie? There you go. Harry Harlow says, Pop told me uh, over and over, if you always tell the truth, you'll never be caught in a lie. There you go. The truth will set you free. Now, I, uh, Terrell, I've never worked with or met Aaron Neville, uh, although I appreciate his artistry. He is one talented dude. Um, David Barubi says, I'm very new to taxi. Do we sell rights for music we pitch or do we keep them? 
Um, most of the time, in the context of film and TV music, when you're working with a publisher, which is commonly known in the film and TV side of things as a production music library or just a music library, more often than not, you're going to give up the publisher's share. Now, you've probably read books. This is something I repeat all the time, so forgive me to you older guys who've been around and heard this a thousand times. Uh, the very, very short course on publishing is every publishing dollar has a publisher's share and a writer's share. The writer's share should always stick with you and you keep 100% of that. The publisher's share, people used to say, oh, keep your publisher's share, but that was in the context of the record industry and writing songs to pitch to other people. That's a debatable issue. Uh, in the context of film and TV, I hate to say it this way, but I can't come up with a better way to say it in short order. The music is somewhat more disposable. If we're talking about your grand opus, a song that's good enough that Lady Gaga would cut it and have a hit with it, don't give up the publishing on that. Hang on to it for as long as you can, or if you're going to give any of it up, give it up for money. Keep the writer's share. In the context of film and TV, it's extremely common. It's the rule of thumb that the publisher gets the publisher's share, you get the writer's share. It's essentially a 50-50 endeavor. It's a 50-50 deal. If there's a dollar made, you get half and the publisher gets half. So yeah, if you've got any friends who've been around, you know, on the periphery of the music industry for a long time, you're giving up half your publishing? What are you, crazy? Tell them they just don't know the reality of how things are. And frankly, you're going to keep making new music. So unless you've got that once in a lifetime, you know, grand opus, it's going to be a giant hit record, be prepared and be willing to give up the publisher's share. So that the publisher is going to make money if they go get you a deal. Simple. Um, is your music trash? No, but it's disposable. Got it. Yeah. I, I I only, I, disposable is not a great choice of words for it. I don't mean that it's like eh, mediocre, so it's disposable. I mean that you, you're, you're going to learn by being a taxi member to crank out a lot of music. You will get better with everything that you write, everything that you record and produce. And a year from now, you look back at the music that you've got on your hard drive today and you'll go, man, I thought I was so great, but I actually wasn't that great. Um, Taxi helps you get better and faster and more productive. So you're always cranking out new music. It's a numbers game. It is a numbers game. And in the film and TV side of the industry, they're not looking for, wow, what a brilliant composer or wow, what a brilliant song. They're looking for music that enhances the emotion of a scene or the energy of a scene. They're looking for music that makes the scene better. They're not looking for the song to be the star because if the song is the star, then the script is not, the actors are not. Um, you don't want your music to be the star because if it is, they're not gonna use it and they don't want it to be the star. So they're looking for music that enhances the scene by you know, bolstering the emotion or maybe taking a scene that doesn't have enough emotion and really pumping it up. You'll see. Just keep watching Taxi TV. Go to the Taxi Forum at forums with an S, forums.taxi.com. Read the newsletter every month. Watch the videos on our Taxi TV channel on YouTube. All that stuff, because all of our successful members are doing all of those things. They've learned a lot. They've crossed a lot of chasms, both emotionally and talent-wise, and now they become successful. So just follow their lead and you too can become successful. Ken Messford says, I don't think a taxi's listings is my artistic outlet. I'm looking at it as a job. I make music for personal art for my personal artistic expression as well. That's exactly right. You know I love the phrase. Some people hate me for it. But um, think of, of making music, especially for media, as you're painting houses by day so that you can paint, paint portraits at night. They use many of the same skills. They use paint. They use brushes and skills, all that stuff. But 
just because you're doing music for film and TV where they're not looking for great songs or your grand opus doesn't mean that you still can't do that stuff as well. Let the film and TV stuff support you financially so that you can go after the big record deal or you can go after the big cut with Lady Gaga. Baby Princess Barbie Salas. Hello, everyone. Well, hello, Baby Princess. That sounds like a, a doll that my five-year-old granddaughter would have. Oh, look, here's Baby Princess. Um, all right, we've got one minute left. Wow, can't believe this hour and a half is gone. Anyway, so there you go. We had, I hope, a good productive session talking about New Year's resolutions for 2021. I hope you found some helpful stuff. I will endeavor, uh, as soon as this show's over today, I'm going to send this Word doc that undoubtedly has some typos in it. I think I've cleaned most of them up. But I will send you, I will send this to Bria. She will post it um, in the blog section of the Taxi website, which we don't use often enough and uh, we will provide you guys with a link. Maybe we'll put it in your member profile, send it out as an alert so that every taxi member that logs into their account can see it, download it, take what they want from it, use it, and have an extremely productive 2021. With that, I would like to bid you a fond farewell. Don't forget to give us a like. <laughs> oh, there's the cab. Don't forget to give us a like if you haven't already. Don't forget to subscribe. Hit that alert bell so that you get alerts when we go live. Um, if you've never joined us for a taxi quarantini happy hour, we will be doing one tomorrow at 4 o'clock right here on YouTube. Um, it's an informal hang where we just hang out. And we talk about it could be a continuation of today's conversation. It could be new information. We could be talking about the gophers in my backyard or the gigantic uh, zucchinis that I grew over the summer. Um, we talk about anything, life, love, mostly music. So with that, I bid you a fond farewell. Thanks for showing up. Thank you, Liz. Good night, all. Hey.